Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. We have a very special guest today. He's actually a fan favorite of yours. It's Dr. Joel Furman. He is an amazing resource. He's published over 14 books. He's a New York Times bestselling author, an amazing person. And he's going to be demystifying lectins. Uh, so many people are confused about this. You won't be after the end of this interview. So let's start straight in. Joel Furman, a fan favorite of the Goodness Level Live podcast. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. So on Wish today's you. call, we would love to demystify lectins. Some people are still confused about it. There's been some popular, obviously, authors and studies that are going around. And people think, uh, you know, things that contain lectins, uh, they're like the enemy of the state, really. So we thought of no better person for you to demystify this issue. So tell us, what is a lectin? Um, and you know, maybe what are some of the, the bad science that's, science that's been going on around lectins? Right. Well, you know, foods have a lot of different components to them. They have thousands of different intricacies. And I always say every strawberry has like 700 nutrients in it, you know, so foods are complicated. And usually in the surface of foods, there's these proteins that bind to certain carbohydrates, usually at the surface or near the surface called lectins. And they're one of the type of nutrients in foods that some people call anti-nutrients. Now, they're called anti-nutrients like oxalates, um, lectins, phytates. There are certain things that bind nutrients and, you know, like bind calcium and bind zinc. And they're called like oxalates bind calcium and they're considered anti-nutrients, the nutrients that are not good in food. But we're finding out with more study and investigation about these substances that they don't just do bad things that they do actually good things. And even the anti-nutrients do good things by attracting harmful parts of like toxic metals or toxins or, or they, are, they are to have other effects on um, killing cancer cells more than their harm good cells. So there's always like the good and bad things. So we're finding out with lectins, there's two things. That lectins themselves, when they're, number one, they're a certain type of lectins that can cause some damage to cells. And when they're cooked, the ability to damage our cells goes down, and then if they're cooked properly, disappears completely. And the, the biggest um, known effect of lectins with cooking is with beans. We know people can get sick when they eat like red kidney beans or large hard beans that aren't thoroughly cooked and made soft. And you can cook things in a crock pot or and boil them in water and still keep the bean firm and still the lectins especially the ones that can cause agglutination of blood, of clumping of the blood and platelet agglutination can actually be harmful and cause people to have to be hurt by them. So we're talking here about beans, most types of large beans like um, red kidney beans, cannoli beans, azuki beans, most of these um, beans have to be soaked and cooked thoroughly. And that means cooked until they're soft. A bean that's in a can isn't going to bother you because it's cooked and then put in a can and soaked in water a long time. A bean that's soaked overnight and cooked for two hours, you can generally tell when the bean is soft. It's the, the, the lectins lose their negative properties, but they still maintain some of their advantageous and nutritive properties, which means that they slow the, the foods that contain these lectins and the lectins themselves when they're deactivated. They slow the absorption of carbohydrates into the bloodstream, having an anti-diabetic effect. They also, they also help fuel the growth of healthy bacteria in the gut, which also, have a, which also those healthy bacteria slow the absorption of glucose through the digestive tract wall as, as well. And beans, which are normally high in lectins, are the foods richest in resistant starch. And the resistant starch, food, foods that are high in resistant starch like beans, have some lectins, and the lectins and the resistant starch work together to form the right type of milieu to build up the bacteria in the gut and thicken the biofilm that coats the villi. Now, what I'm saying is that the, that the negative effect of the lectin is diminished and eliminated with cooking, but the positive effects where the lectin actually can become harmful to cells in their uncooked form actually only become harmful to cancerous cells in their cooked form. So now the lectins seem having a function to reduce the possibility of replicating of cells replicating that are prone to cancer or that are in a precancerous state. Lectins aid in the body's immune system to recognize and eliminate 
and that's called, the word is called apoptosis. And the word apoptosis means destroying cells that should be destroyed. We want to destroy abnormal cells and remove them before they can cause worth, worse damage. So lectins are part of the anti-cancer mechanisms that beans have, and perhaps one of the reasons added on why beans are so protective in scientific studies to fight cancer. And populations that eat beans live longer too. Now beans have other beneficial properties like they're very high in inositol penticus phosphate, which also causes death in cancer cells. And beans, as you know, are the lowest glycemic of all carbohydrate foods, and they have very they are very rich in slowly digestible carbohydrates. So their overall glycemic load is very low. They enter the, the glucose from carbohydrate from beans into the bloodstream very low. Now we know that, for example, 200 grams of glucose entering the bloodstream from corn, from peas, from potato, from white bread, all comes in at different speeds, and the same and the speed at which the glucose enters the bloodstream determines how much insulin is produced by the body in response to that glucose entering the bloodstream. And we find that our lifespan is enhanced. Our brain, the aging of the brain is slowed and we overall age slower when we eat more plant carbohydrates whose carbohydrate enters the bloodstream at a more, as a, at a slower pace. So the level of insulin produced by the pancreas can stay lower. So when we have a lower glycemic, lower insulin response, the carbohydrate is more favored for longevity. And that's what beans show in the scientific studies. They show for every tablespoon a day that people eat of beans, lifespan is enhanced by 4%. Two tablespoons, 8%, four tablespoons, 30. It beans just seem to, and that means if you eat enough beans, you live forever. This is amazing information. So we're just taking a quick break to remind you guys to like, subscribe, and share this video. Lectins are so confusing to people and unnecessarily so. So if you want to get this information shared with more you know, friends and family and other people that need to know this life-changing information, hit that like button. Helps us in the, you know, the old YouTube algorithm world. And it just gets this message to the people that need to hear it the most. All right, let's dive straight back into the interview. So let me just. So cool. It's so cool. So just to clarify, so if I eat beans, do I need, I, do I need a, a certain supplement to protect me from lectins? Is this because this is really sort of I think what people are getting confused by? They need to like, you know, plant to the enemy, and they need to take a supplement. Is that is there any science based on, upon that? No, no. There's no supplement that can protect you from undercooked beans or or the dangerous effect of lectins. And once the beans is thoroughly cooked, there's nothing been shown in the scientific literature that you can take something to protect you from the dangerous effect of undercooked beans. It's, be, it's not cooking beans sufficiently that's the problem, not the beans themselves. Beans are a food we um, are desirous and healthy to eat cooked. And that's why I don't recommend a raw food diet because there's too many benefits of beans which can only be eaten safely cooked. And if we make the diet raw, then you can't eat beans, you know. So. And there's also some benefits to eating cooked mushrooms as well. Mushrooms are tremendously benefit and they're, they're the body's, they're the diet's richest source of ergotheanine. And there's an ergotheanine receptor on our cells. Most cells in our bodies have ergotheanine receptors that stabilize the DNA. And so in some way, nature, you know, we know that we're supposed to be taking an ergotheanine or our body wouldn't have a receptor for it. But mushrooms don't only have ergotheanine, they have a host of other beneficial qualities as well as they, you know, they promote, they have anti-angiogenic effects, anti-angiogenic effects. That means they prevent the growth of blood vessels from being excessively growing that allow cancer cells to grow, allow fat to grow. They, they say, they, ref, they prevent fat from growing, they prevent cancer cells from growing. Now beans also, because of the inositol pensicus phosphate and the amount of polyphenols in beans, also have some anti-estrogenic effects and anti-aromatase effects as well, and they also support the both of good bacteria. What I'm saying right now is it's the mixture of foods that you put together in your diet that gives you the overall best assortment and variety of beneficial bacteria that seem to live in harmony with each other and work in harmony with our digestive tract cells, preventing inflammation and slowing the absorption of glucose. And it's these four foods, which consists of green vegetables, onions, mostly raw, two raw foods and two cooked foods. The two raw foods are 
raw green vegetables like salad and raw cruciferous greens and raw onion or scallion. And the two cooked foods are the beans and the mushrooms. And I'm saying incorporating this, these four foods into your diet, the two raw and the two cooked, maximizes the, the health benefits, the anti-cancer effects, and the anti-diabetic or anti-glycemic effects. Weight loss favorable. And don't forget the anti-estrogenic effects because excessive estrogen is increasing risk of breast and prostate cancer. So what I'm saying right now is that, um, that there's an anti, that beans and um, greens and mushrooms and onions have anti-aromatase effects because fat cells and fat on the body produces more aromatase activity and these foods diminish that, lower estrogen levels. Mushrooms are particularly strong at lowering estrogen levels in the body. And soybeans in particular, which get a bad rap on the internet because there's so many billions of dollars spent by companies promoting meat and are, there's so many anti-plant-based um, dollars being spent and they want to attack soy or attack or use lectins. It's just billions of dollars being spent to say it's not good to eat vegetables and beans. It's better to eat meat and cheese. It's because people don't want to because the meat and cheese and dairy industry and egg industry doesn't want to lose their customers. And there's so much evidence that, the, that consuming those foods create problems, so they want to come back with ideas of how to attack vegetables so people will be somewhat confused, so, they, then, they won't, so then most people won't go to plant-based diets. There's a tremendous amount of money being, um, being pushed to counter all the evidence about the longevity-promoting effects of diets higher in plants and lower in animal products. So one of the things that comes out of this is this idea that soybeans are bad. When the, when the reality is, the, the studies show that soy in particular um, binds to uh, multiple types of estrogen receptors. We're talking here about the, um, the two types of estrogen receptors and the genistein or the isoflavoins in soy. They have anti-estrogenic effects on the breast and prostate. They, they, when they, they block estrogen from stimulating those estrogen receptors in breast and prostate tissue. So rather than you think that those estrogen-like compounds increase risk, they bear very powerful decreased risk. So what I'm saying right now that a whole soybean with its fiber intact, like a frozen soybean edamame or a dried soybean that you soak in water and cook into a soup or a chili or a soybean that's fermented and made into a paste like tempeh, that these whole soybean products have been shown to have tremendous effects at lowering prostate and breast cancers. So much effects that there, even though all beans show an effect, these soybeans have even a more powerful effect at lowering cancer. When you, and so we want people to have a variety of beans and eat some soybeans and other beans to get the maximum effects. And interestingly, that the same, even though they block the estrogen receptors, I'm saying the genistein, a form of isoflavones from soy, block the stimulation of estrogen to breast tissue. But it actually binds to the, K, the, the um, E2, the other estrogen receptors on muscle and bone, having an estrogen positive effect, strengthening bone mass and muscle strength. So in act actually helping you with bone density with aging. So where you wanna have a little estrogenic effects with aging, you get that from soy, but where you don't wanna have the estrogenic effect on the breast and prostate, you don't get that from soy. So soybeans have a tremendously protective effects and used in conjunction with other beans, highlight and improve the overall anti-cancer effects of the diet. So cool. Thank you for clearing all of that up, Dr. Furman. We love it. We love it. Um, I, I have always thought about soy. I think um, obviously the milk industry, the dairy industry has gone hard into trying to uh, uh, vilify the little soybean. I always think that right. if oat milk was the first dairy alternative, there'd be lots of uh, so-called studies around how oats are so bad for us as well. So it's interesting. Uh, soy took the fall for the other <laughs> alternate milks, I think. Um, but with lectins, I obviously, um, uh, you know, there's studies saying that lectins are bad. Obviously, if you scroll through PubMed, most of the studies are talking about how um, they're amazing anti-cancer <laughs> benefits to it, but there are some studies that um, show that lectins are bad. What do you see uh, as being the issue with these particular studies? How do they match up with the other studies and um, what should we as consumers be aware of? Right. Um, well, we've been discussing that lectins can be harmful. Some lectins can be harmful if they're not cooked. But there are some people with who have inflamed their bowel, who have an, um, leaky gut or inflamed bowel, and some people are, have allergies to certain foods. 
And even though they're overall healthy for general population, there may be some foods like um, wheat, soy, beans, you know, even certain fruit um, can annoy or cause digestive issues with certain individuals. And some people get bloating and digestion, stomach pain with eat too many beans because now it's not only coming from the lectins, it's because there's so much resistant starch which don't get broken down by enzymes, which they ferment in the, in the gut and produce gas. And the gas from the ferment, fermentation, the resistant starch causes bloating and indigestion. And so it's a common, it's not just the lectins. So when people are on a diet that's like high in meat and not used to eating beans, they'll have developed more gram negatives and they won't have developed this, the type of bacteria you need to develop to digest beans because they weren't raised with beans in their diet. So those people really, if, they're not, if they are getting symptoms of indigestion or pain or gas, they have to one, cut back on beans and keep it to a low level in their diet, a couple of tablespoons, and eat that at one or two tablespoons or just one tablespoon a day or one tablespoon twice a day to give yourself time to develop the bacteria and not eat too many beans at one time to allow their body to, over time, develop the healthy bacteria that it takes to digest beans well. And so... Um, with any food that you're not used to eating, it could take some time to get used to digesting it. And the other thing is, is that people, because they're eating eggs and porridge and breads and pizza and cheese, you don't really need to chew those foods very well because there's not a lot of fiber in them that has to be broken down. And the nutrients aren't tied up behind a package. The nutrients are just released. So people learn to inhale their food and they don't really chew that well. And it doesn't matter. They still can digest it if they don't chew it that well. But when you come down to certain foods like broccoli and beans, even when they're cooked, if you don't chew it really well, you're going to have trouble digesting it. And so we always say when a person has you know, irritable bowel syndrome or they don't digest beans well, we, all, we just say or you know, cut back on the overeating, eat, cut back on the volume, and now make sure you chew everything to a liquid before you swallow it and practice chewing and mixing the food with the bacteria in the mouth between the teeth and the gums and your saliva so you feel like when you're swallowing everything's liquefied. Because by the way, when you chew things in the mouth, including green vegetables and beans, they produce nitric oxide. The, the interaction between the teeth and the bacteria in the teeth produce more beneficial nutrients and anti-inflammatory beneficial, you could say, products that help with the digestion and assimilation of the food. So one of the problems are that people aren't practiced in chewing well because they're not raised on these plant-based diets and don't realize that to chew the plants and get the most nutrients out of them, you have to chew them much better than you'd have to chew eggs or cheese or something like that or, or, um, or oatmeal or even or, or bread, you know. Thank you. We know you have um, <clears throat> so much success with people that come into, say, your um, retreat and they've got so many addictions, their microbiome, as you discussed, they've, they've just been raised on, you know, just all, you know, the sad American diet, basically. And so they enter your doors and um, you've got all like, obviously, this wealth of knowledge and you're going to take someone um, and, the, but, you know, they may be just, uh, you know, on. I think some of the stories you've shared with me about people that are just basically, you should, you've told people to go to hospital, their, their blood pressure is that high. Or, right. or whatnot. So how do you take someone, what does that, that first 24 to 48 hours look like for someone? If someone's listening to this, like, man, I need to change my diet, but I don't know how. What's that first 24 to 48 hours look like? Well, the reason why that's such a good question is because you get, because people don't recognize that they could feel worse temporarily when they start eating healthfully. It's not just indigestion, not being able to digest all the plant matter. It's that they have so much nitrogenous waste and buildup of acids in their tissues that they're losing weight, but, they're, but they've hold on so much fluid and they could start to feel weak and fatigue. The mobilization of toxins and waste could cause them to be headache and, and more agitated. But what I'm saying right now is that when a person stops alcohol, when they stop smoking, when they stop using cocaine, and when they stop using fast food and processed foods and they start eating a healthy diet based on salads and vegetable soups and things like that and, and you know, and, and, and they start to feel worse temporarily going through withdrawal from their old diet. They're actually, so you, it's a good point to make that people shouldn't judge how well it tastes and they shouldn't judge how well it, they feel until the first week passes. And then they usually start to feel better after the first five or six days. They may be even headachey the first, you know, and they're, but so in any case, um, when they come in, we're uh, taking some blood usually, evaluating them, you know, measuring their how their body fat, their visceral fat, 
seeing what kind of risks they have, make sure we know about them. And then we're going to adjust the diet and the medications. And usually we're going to decide, you know, when to start cutting back on medications, maybe watch the person's blood pressure, watch their blood glucose, because we know that if they start eating so healthfully and their medications are not reduced relatively quickly, their blood pressure could get too low and their blood sugar could get too low. When you're, on, when you're eating poorly, these people need all these medications, but when they're eating so healthfully, within like three or four days, you could have a person passed out with, with low blood pressure. You know, when they're eating so healthfully, they just, they don't need these medications. So we know, we want to measure them just to know how careful we have to be and, and about watching their blood pressure or blood glucose. So we're going to be aware of, cu- uh, of reducing and eliminating medications gradually. That's mostly what we're looking for in the first week. So it's the skill is involved in, is not giving prescribing medications, but which ones to cut back on first and how, how much to reduce it. Like, for example, with the um, person on a blood pressure medication, we're usually stopping the diuretics first. Then we're going to reduce the beta blockers, not stop them suddenly. When a person's on inhalers for their asthma, we're going to usually take away the long-acting beta agonists, but leave on the inhaled corticosteroids, and then we're going to eventually cut that back. The, the rate at which we take away medications, the one that can cause the most side effects, with the diabetics, we take away the glisphos- the um, sulfonylureas because they push the failing cells in the beta and the pancreas to work too hard. So those are the ones you stop first. You leave on the metformin and the insulin. You stop them later. You first get them off the sulfonylureas. So the issue is like, you know, which medications to reduce and and, and as you're aware, sometimes people are psychologically having a rough time the first week because they think that they're giving up things and they're feeling that emotional loss of having to give up their illicit love affair with, with unhealthy foods. They can't eat donuts. They're not going to be eating pizza. They're not going to be eating, you know, so they, so they feel like there's some loss. But we show them that this is not losing, it's gaining because they can eat so many more delicious things that taste really great and they're going to love eating this way and they're not going to feel that loss. But at the beginning... They're still focused on the loss, and that's why I have people here for a long time so they can really see that this is not about losing. It's about gaining your health and regaining a tremendous amount of taste ability and more enjoyment of eating, not less enjoyment of eating. But it takes a while to convince that and actually demonstrate that with people that it enhances their enjoyment but doesn't decrease their enjoyment. Awesome. How long does it take for those food cravings? Like, um, because. So many people struggle with this, like they might be listening to this and they're on that diet and, you know, they're just addicted, right? They've just got that sugar, salt, fat combination thing that's been pumped into them since they were kids. And this is the way their brains work. How long does it take to actually shape, reshape sort of like someone's taste buds or their brain addiction to these foods? It's a process. It's just that improves every week. It's not all or nothing, but the real answer to the question is, to get your taste buds complete, you know, really healthy again, takes about six months. You know, it doesn't happen in six weeks. But but in six weeks, they are a lot better. You know, they still get starting to taste the food better. They're enjoying it more. They changed a lot. But it doesn't mean that. And at three months, they're really a lot better. But it still continues to improve. Their taste can continue to improve till six, till they're out six months. And they they can enjoy a flavor of a strawberry more. An avocado or a piece of lettuce has sweetness to it. They start to really. I can just eat a plain carrot and really enjoy just a plain carrot. Before they were saying, oh, "I'm not eating carrot. That's disgusting." Like, what do you think? We live on carrots, so I might as well be dead. But after a while, they're saying, "Hey, I, hey, I like carrots. It's just it's a good, it's just a carrot or a, or a snow pea pot. It tastes good with nothing on. An artichoke has flavor. It has nothing on it. It's just a plain artichoke heart that's been steamed and it tastes good with nothing on it." They can't believe it. That actually has flavor, you know. Thank you. Um, so for all of us at home, uh, and we've learned about the amazing benefits of beans, and uh, and for our viewers, they might not have incorporated these sorts of foods into their diet before, or they don't know where to start with it. What would you recommend? What sort of uh, what are some easy meal ideas for incorporating beans and the the onions that you were talking about before? Um, to make a soup once a week and put the beans and the onions and the mushrooms in the soup. My, you know, what I like people to do is that they soak the beans the night before, mush, mush them around with your hand and then pour off the water and don't use that water could have dirt in them and then use fresh water to cook the soup in and put the first thing you do with the, make the soup is put the beans up on water and get it cooking. And then you could, you know, blend the onions in the blender and make some vegetable juice out of the carrots or celery and pour that in there. Then you could cut the zucchinis up and cut the mushrooms up and do other things. But the first thing you do is get the beans cooking in the, in the pot. So the time you finish putting everything in the pot, and that took you 40 minutes to get the soup made, 
Then you time it for another, so another hour, so it cooks for a full two hours. So you have this bubbling liquid boiling for two hours, and then you know you have a, a great soup. And then once you have this hot pot, you've made enough food for maybe a soup that you can use over the next five days. And I put that whole pot in a shelf in my refrigerator, so the next day when it cools off, I can put it into like, you know, 10 different containers like this and, and take it to work with me or something, you know, or travel and just grab it for lunch with a salad or something. So soups are really great because you can throw the mushrooms in there and you can throw a lot of onions and green vegetables in and all types of stuff in there and spices make it taste really good. So almost most days I have for lunch a salad and a bowl of vegetable bean soup. And so, and a piece of fruit for dessert or some frozen cherries or whatever, you know, something, but, or something sweet for dessert, like an apricot or something. But most days I have a big salad in the soup for lunch. And so I just mostly gets my beans in through the soup. But if I don't have the soup, I put the beans on top of the salad or we make a bean burger or we make a bean chili or we make some kind of bean dish, separate, you know, other than that. Great suggestion. Thank you. So a lot of people that have, you know, where it's still a few months into the pandemic, that previous video we did with you about supporting the immune system was super popular. So I'm curious, are there any updates um, just on someone that's probably maybe being glued too much to the TV, um, too much obsession on case numbers, et cetera, and they've put on weight and they've just been sitting on their, on their couch and their sofa. So what, what are the immune benefits to beans? And maybe for some people might've been avoiding them because they think lectins have lowered their immune system. Is there a positive benefit for their immune system? Absolutely. And let's not minimize the fact that the most dangerous thing for your immune system is being fat, you know, is being overweight. And when beans become your major protein source, you lose weight. And when beans become your major carbohydrate source, you lose weight. The weight pours off you with the beans because they, they fill you up and they make you feel like you ate a lot of food. When you, when you have 200 calories of beans, it feels like you ate 300 calories. But then you only get 150 calories in because the beans pass through you and they, part of that part is resistant to digestion. All the calories don't even come into your bloodstream anyway. What I'm saying, they're a fantastic weight loss food and being overweight is one of the primary causes of dying or serious being ill with COVID and being overweight is a significant risk factor for cancer and is a major cause of cancer in the modern world. I say, I make this ridiculous statement that people say, ah, that's nonsense. And I say, olive oil causes cancer. And the reason why it's so radical and why, I'm, why what I'm saying is true is because people use so much olive oil that it makes them gain weight and it keeps them overweight. And being overweight is a major factor for cancer. It's not the olive oil is carcinogenic. It's that the olive oil kept them over, being overweight so fat on their body and being fat key is carcinogenic. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So Excellent. beans, besi besides beans having all these um, beneficial nutrients, they help people lose weight. When they, because they're low, they're the lowest glycemic carbohydrate, and as, and they're all, and because look at the carbohydrate content of beans, because part of that carbohydrate content is lost when you digest it, that means the protein that was in beans, the percent of total calories, is actually higher than what's measured on the on the that's that's considered that's usually considered. If the beans are thirty percent protein, and they're sixty percent starch and ten percent fat we realize the protein is really higher than 30% because the 60% of carbohydrates are not all coming in. You're going to lose up a big percent of those. So the percent of total calories in the protein is even more than 30%. Be so beans really are good for you know, building muscle and maintaining your strength and keeping yourself slim at the same time. It helps your body maintain what we want to maintain. That's being strong and slim. Awesome. And just before we wrap up, um, we loved um, the time we spent with you at your retreat in San Diego. And it's such an incredible place of transformation where people come in from all walks of life with all sorts of critical conditions and they're totally transformed. So I'd be curious, is there a certain story or a client testimonial that has come to the retreat and has incorporated this diet and then has had an amazing result? Oh, everybody has amazing results, <laughs> except when they <laughs> go back question. and go off. Yeah, so many people have amazing results. Well, you know, what's amazing to me is that some people come there and they're agitated when they arrive and they're negative when they arrive and they're argumentative when they arrive and they don't even know why they were told they had to, their family pushed them into well, a friend told them they had to come here and when they and they see how healthy this is, they're rebelling against it. And so the the beautiful stories are that we see is after people are here for a while, they become more loving 
appreciative. They enjoy the diet more. They start enjoying the world around them more. They start to get back into their studies, their schoolwork, or their job with more enthusiasm, more passion. They become kinder people. For example, I had a person who was here, um, and she, she was very, very agitated and upset when she arrived. No way she could eat this way. No way she was going to eat this way. No way she was going to be healthy. She wasn't going to give up. But at, but but the time she left, she had lost a hundred pounds. Wow. And and she was so much of a different human being and so grateful and so grateful that she was there and and when once it felt like it was family it was felt like it was family and that she was leaving her family and we became so close with it so we become so close with our guests that it feels like it's, and they and we feel that it that when they eat so healthfully from the foods that we nurture from the soils that we nurtured and the you know the compost we're making and the we're growing you know, we actually are affecting people's future happiness and even though people may get rid of rheumatoid arthritis or the psoriasis may go away or their kidney function from the lupus improved, they got off their plaquenil or the fluid around the heart that was there now has disappeared. And they can come off the medications for the autoimmune disease. They don't have the fluid around their heart anymore, which are great stories. But the most beautiful things is how people change the way they think and leave so much happier where they feel great control of their life. They're in control of what they eat. They enjoy eating this way. And they really wouldn't think of going back to the old way of self-poisoning that kept them in a prison. You know, the prisoner that kept them in being overweight and sickly and taking drugs and having to go to doctors all the time and thinking that that was the only choice they had and the only way they can live. This frees, it, it's freeing. And my, and my most sad, the biggest satisfaction we get is watching these people who kind of feel like they're been released from prison and they can go back and have a happy life again. And this girl, this woman now, she, you know, felt like she could never get married, could never have a family, couldn't have a, you know, she, her whole trajectory of her life has now changed. Beautiful. What a wonderful story to share. Thank you, Dr. Berman. I, I know that you have a special event coming up. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Well, you know, with this COVID um, time, we run a lot of our live event, events that we used to run in hotels and things. We run them right through Zoom and we're doing a week weight loss boot camp and incorporating time restricted eating, which some people call intermittent fasting into the boot camp. So we have a lot of cooking classes, a lot of lecture, lectures over the week. And of course, some time just spent with the food addiction counselors. And we're really getting people like kind of all the basics they need to revamp their life and do this in their own home, start all over again. We give them the 21 days of menus, shopping lists, meal plans, everything to eat. And I say to people, don't decide what to eat. Don't eat what you like to eat, what you feel like eating, what you think you should eat. Just eat what I'm telling you to eat because you're going to love it if you keep eating it. And we're going to give you all the recipes, exactly what to buy. And you're going to see the magic happens. When you do this 100%, magic happens to the body. You're going to throw out excess fluid. The acids are going to go away. So we, we have this boot camp that people join from their homes, through Zoom, from around the world, and we give them a lot of information over this week, and then we follow them when they leave, and we see if they can maintain it to, to give them what they feel is the most important elements to help them maintain this program. So I have, obviously, one of these boot camps coming up November 4th, so hopefully people interested will join, will join me with this. Beautiful, and so for our viewers listening, that that listen to that and uh that sounds really exciting i know that sounds wonderful to me um it's that we you can see a link in our show notes below but um Great. thank you so much oh if oh. Uh, someone is watching this video after november 4 what's the best way of okay yes um uh, your book, Dr. Furman, for those that can't join this event or are watching this after november 4 uh can you tell us a little bit about your new book eat for life right uh, you know i have um I've written many books, like about 12 or 13 books, <laughs> but my most recent book is Eat for Life, and I do recommend that people who want to begin with learning my work, start with the most recent book, because it's the most up-to-date, most up-to-date research. It's very comprehensive, so it's a great place to start, Eat for Life, and of course, they can come to my website at drperman.com and get more information, see about my books and my upcoming events, or even learn about the retreat, you know? Awesome. Wonderful. Well, we couldn't think of a better resource. Yes. Buy the book. It's such an important work that you're doing, Dr. Furman, in this, you know, very, you know, interesting time that we live in. And so thank you so much for the time that you've shared and demystifying lectins. This is such a great, great, you know, like resource <laughs> for that. So thank you so much. Terrific. Okay. Good talking to you guys and best of health to everybody. Beans, beans, the magical fruit. The more you eat, the more you... Toot. But we know that that's false, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, it's not false. Actually, no, that is false. The more you eat, the less you toot. Exactly. <laughs>
<laughs> so um, don't let the Simpsons propaganda get to your mind. Um, beans are super important, right? So we need to uh, get this message out far and wide. So, and if you're struggling with weight, why not check out that, um, that seminar, the weight yes. loss thing coming up. There's so much rubbish online about weight loss, so many scammy products. Dr. Furman is the real deal. He gets results, has an incredible, uh, you know, retreat out there in San Diego. You know, unless you're there, you can feel it. You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't understand how much of a cool place it is. So make sure you get onto that. And if you're watching this video, post that event and buy his books, like go Eat to his website, life. follow him on social media. He is like, he's like the Gandalf of our generation, leading us <laughs> through all this dietary storm and confusion. So anyway, thanks so much for joining us. And if you really enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe. It helps get this message out to the people who need to hear it the most. And what do you think? Like, what do you think about lectins? We'd love to hear your comments below. Agree, disagree, whatever. Anyway, have an awesome week and we'll see you next time.